morning. For those of you joining us online, we're sorry about the slight delay, little technical issues, but uh, we're glad you could be with us here today. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Brad Heitzma. I have the privilege of serving as the pastor here at Liberty Valpo, and uh, excited you guys chose to worship with us here this morning. Um, it would be hard not to know the events that unroll, unraveled, really, uh, this past week in Afghanistan. What you might not have known is that up until last week, Afghanistan was the second fastest growing Christian church in the world. Second fastest growing Christian church. They were gaining incredible momentum. The nation of Afghanistan has a national ID system. And Christians in that country, encouraged by the growth of the Christian church, began changing their religious affiliation on that record system to Christian. And last week, before the invasion of Kabul, began receiving letters, some of which read, we know where you are and we know what you're doing. See, the Taliban now has access to those records and have begun showing up at people's houses. Last Saturday, when the terror group had already overtaken dozens of provinces in the nation and were approaching the capital of Kabul, the Taliban was at a pastor's door. Thankfully, he had already gone into hiding. Currently, the Taliban is stopping people in the streets and checking their phones looking for the Bible app to identify them as Christians. One Afghan pastor wrote that I read this week, uh, talks about how three days earlier his 14-year-old daughter had been kidnapped and given to the Taliban as a wife. Just this morning I read this online. Uh, this is from an organization in touch with the Christian church out there. It says, we've received news that the underground church in Kabul, Afghanistan, has been martyred. Our friends have been in contact and met together last night in deep prayer. The last word she spoke was, we feel your prayers because this supernatural boldness came over us. And we were singing in the spirit. Even the kids said, mom, we will not deny Jesus. As they were on the phone... They heard screaming, and they heard gunshots. The reply in the post said, God is so powerful, they went to be with the Creator, filled with joy. The Christian church in America thinks we're under persecution when we're asked to wear masks, or to meet online for a week or so, or a month or so, or a season. This is real persecution. This is a faith that has real consequences and has a real danger to it. You remember the videos of the beheadings on the beach by ISIS? For many Christians, there is a real cost to their faith. And for many, that cost is their lives. What we call persecution here is really just an inconvenience. Today, in our passage, in the book of Revelation, we're going to look at another real persecuted church, the church in Smyrna. So if you brought your Bibles, let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. We're in a series called Pulse Check, and we're actually looking at the seven letters of Jesus to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Last week, we looked at Ephesus. Today, Smyrna... Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 8, which reads this. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray. Lord God, as we dive into your word this morning, as we look at this letter to the church and yet see very real life events playing out at the same time, God, will you help us to see this passage through your eyes, with fresh eyes. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to understand that you are a God who is there even in persecution. And Lord, even though we may not be in a persecuted church, some people here may be feeling the weight of either being antagonized for their faith or just generally being antagonized. God, I believe your word has something for them as well this morning. So Lord, as we dive into this, open our ears to hear. Help us to quiet down the thoughts and concerns of our day and to lean into what you have for us and the truths that we can pull from your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So today, our message, our week looks at persecution in the church. Afghanistan, Smyrna. But it also applies to, as I mentioned in the prayer, individual persecution. It also, really the same word uh, is, are, are there for us whenever we're feeling or being attacked. And the first thing that I want us to pull out of the scripture comes right out of verse 9, where Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. What are the first two words? Well, we don't have it on the screen. What are the first two words of that passage? I know. I know. Whatever it is you're walking through, whatever the situation that you find yourself in, Jesus knows. He is right there with you. He is relating to your situation. He can provide comfort because he has the same experience. My wife uh, has suffered a traumatic brain injury about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, spinal issues after that. Two years ago, uh, this, today, she was still in ICU uh, at Northwestern with necrotizing fasciitis, your basic flesh-eating bacteria that we all seem to get. She lives in a constant level of pain. And as much as I try on certain days to relate or to provide comfort for that, I really can't say ever that I know what she's going through. I have no way of completely being able to relate to her experience. When Jesus starts out his passage with, I know, it's because he has walked in our shoes and has experienced enough human persecution and human pain to know. He knows. It says, he knows their tribulation, which directly translated means the persecution that they're experiencing. He knows their poverty, talking about a financial poverty, but yet they are rich spiritually. And he knows the slander. He knows the lies that are told about them. Persecution for your faith should not ever come as a surprise. Listen to this passage from 1 Peter. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And then verse 16 says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in that name. Don't be surprised when persecution comes. Don't be surprised when you're facing trials and struggles. It's interesting that we read in here that some of the persecution, though, actually comes from the Jews, from the church, from, from the religious people. Jesus calls them in here the synagogue of Satan. So they're the ones who are supposed to be representing God. We're supposed to be living as descendants of Abraham who are living as God's chosen people, but they are often the ones who are causing the most harm. 
synagogue of Satan kind of reveals to us a little bit the true nature and the true source of Christian persecution, that it comes from Satan. Satan is the source and men are the instruments. But God is sovereign. God is sovereign above all. He is on his throne. And as we'll see by the end of our passage, he will reward those who endure. But the judgment can still be intense. Persecution from outside the church can be intense. Persecution inside the church can be intense. The judgments, the looks, the stares, the whispers, the comments behind one's back. Christians know better than others how to dig into someone in the name of the Lord. I remember a prior church I served in this building. Um, one family was dealing with a pregnancy, a child being born out of wedlock. And one of the other members of the church uh, was speaking to this girl's mother in the bathroom and, and, and decided to drop a, a, a scripture bomb on her. Now imagine the pain that this family is walking through and the confusion and the, what does this look like and what are the next steps. And she drops a numbers 3223. Be sure your sin will find you out. Wow. My goal here, and I've said this enough times, that there are no perfect people allowed in this room and in this building. As a matter of fact, I just saw another church downtown that, that, that put that up on their building outside as a sermon series they're doing. I really need to start getting royalties for this. <laughs> the church, judgmentalism can be intense. Maybe your conflict is coming from somewhere else. Maybe it's enemies. Maybe it's friends. Maybe it's at work, school, family, wherever it comes from. I don't know what it is as far as the trouble that you might be facing today, but get this, he knows. He knows. You're not alone in whatever it is you're facing, that you have a Savior and a friend who has been there, one who completely relates to being hurt, being abandoned, being betrayed, being accused falsely. We have a Savior that endured a torture for things he didn't do. Whatever it is you're facing, you are not alone. He knows. He suffered like us. He was tempted like us. He was wrapped in human flesh just so that he could die like us. Hebrews 2 says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, to make a payment, uh, take down the sin on, on, uh, on their behalf. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He knows. And because the Lord of the universe knows intimately what we're walking through, what we're going through, because of that, we do not need to be afraid. The second truth that I see in our passage is it comes from verse 10. It says, do not fear. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Do you know do not fear is quoted over 360, well, 365 times in Scripture? Don't be afraid or do not fear. That's like once for every day. Don't fear. Do not be afraid. Almost every interaction with an angel delivering a message starts out with, do don't be, do not fear. Do not be afraid. Jesus says in this letter to the church, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Don't fear it. The question is why? Well, at the beginning of the passage, Jesus identifies himself as the first and the last. He is the constant throughout all of creation. He was there at the very beginning of creation. He was there before creation. And he will be there far beyond whatever it is we're facing today. Our times are fleeting. But Jesus is forever. Our troubles come and go. But he was there eternally. Amen. He tells the Christians in Smyrna that Satan will throw them to jail for ten days. Now that's 
probably not a real prison. That's most likely referring to you're going to be in a tortured situation. You're going to be stuck. And it's most likely not 240 hours, 10 days, but it means for a short time. For a short time, you will be persecuted. But it's a short time. It's not forever. And it's not eternity. It's a situation that will come and then will go. Pain comes and goes. Mourning comes and goes. Even the worst pain comes and goes. Psalm 30 says, sorrow may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. So don't fear. Don't fear, he says. Don't be afraid of what's going to come to you. Just psychologists agree that we worry about a lot of things. We are wired to worry. Our minds are always thinking about worst case scenarios and what could go wrong. But did you know that 85% of the things we worry about never happen? 85% of the things that keep us up at night, that wake, wake us in a cold sweat, never even happen. So why do we fear them? Well, it turns out we fear the things that are unknown. We fear things we don't know about. I'm realizing this is an extremely heavy message for me and not what you're used to hearing. So let me try to frame it a little bit. Anybody here afraid of roller coasters? One, two, three. I was deathly afraid of roller coasters. I used to be so scared of roller coasters, but then I rode my first one. It's like Six Flags was like a rite of passage. You start with the whizzer, and then you move up to the eagle. And, and you, but I was, I was afraid of roller coasters until I rode one. And then it was pretty cool. So then I liked roller coasters, but I didn't like roller coasters that went upside down. I was deathly afraid of roller coasters that went upside down. Why? Hadn't ridden one before. Thought gravity probably works on me. I would fall out until I rode one, and then I loved it. See, the things that are unknown to us are the worst. How many people here love haunted houses? A few of, it, it's church, but you can still raise your hand. It's okay. You love haunted houses? I remember early on in my marriage, Jen and I went to a haunted house. I like a good haunted house. I like that startle. I like that surprise. Janet does not. She is not a fan at all of haunted houses. And I found that out early on. As we were walking through this haunted house, she was walking safely in front of me. <laughs> and, and, and not knowing what was going to come around each corner. And it was quite possibly one of the most scariest experiences she had ever had in her entire life because of the unknown. Now, I should probably also mention, just for fun, this haunted house was in the Children's Museum in Indianapolis. Really scary. We don't when we don't know what's going to happen, though, our inclination is to be afraid. We fear what is unknown. But when we know the outcome is going to be okay, that takes the thunder away from it. When we know the outcome is going to be fine, we can face what is to come. Jesus says, do not fear. Do not be afraid, because the end will be okay. How many people here are avid readers? How many people here skip to the end of the book to see what's going to happen during the crisis part? A couple of us. Jesus gives us a little bit of a, a glimpse into the end of the book. John 16, 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Some translations say, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Whatever it is you're facing, either individually or on a global scale, persecution for your faith or persecution of any kind, 
Fear of the unknown. Fear in a relationship. Fear in school. Fear in a job loss. Fear of the diagnosis. Fear of whatever it is that comes next. Whatever it is, Jesus has been there. And Jesus has overcome. He has you. Isaiah uh, 49 tells us that he has your name written in the palm of his hand. He has you in his grip. So what do we do with that? How do we respond when trials come our way? Well, verse 10 also gives us the answer to that. Be faithful. Be faithful. The passage says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Smyrna was a large city. It was also the center of emperor worship for Roman emperors. Citizens were forced to take a pinch of incense and burn it on a fire and say, Caesar is Lord. Can you see how that would be a problem for some Christians? Because as Christians, who is Lord? Jesus is Lord. Jesus identifies himself at the beginning of the letter as the one who died and came back to life. Why is that important? Because even in death, that's not an obstacle for Christ. He's been there. And even death, he's overcome. Be faithful even unto death. And he says, and I will give you the crown of life. Smyrna was also an athletic city. They would host large athletic games, kind of like a, a version of the Olympics. People would come from all over, and the prize when you won was not a gold medal, but a wreath, a laurel wreath, a crown to put on your head. A crown. That was the prize. Jesus says, I will give you the crown of life. That's the prize for those that ended up being killed for their faithfulness. Life eternal. Verse 11 ends and says that there is no second death for those who overcame. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Currently, the death rate in the United States is hovering right at about 100%. Let, let the math soak in there for a minute. As a matter of fact, several years ago when Jana first went in for a brain surgery, our pastor brought the comforting words of, well, we're all going to die sometime. It wasn't as funny at the time, I promise you. <laughs> Hebrews 9 says, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. The second death is the judgment. The second death is is eternal separation from God. The second death is to be cast into the lake of fire. But for the one who overcomes, they will not be hurt by the second death, he says. Be faithful, no matter what it is you're facing. Life or death or personal struggle, be faithful. Never leave that first love like we talked about last week. Be faithful. Run to Jesus instead of away from him. Let me dip back over to Afghanistan for a minute. This was a message that was uh, circulated. It says, we have 22 underground pastors in Afghanistan. This was from an organization, a mission organization out there. And only two have been able to escape. The Taliban overran the country so quickly that they are trapped. We're in contact with all of them, and the situation is terrible. Most do not expect to survive. Please pray as we are trying to find a way to rescue, but it looks impossible. And then a name that's redacted said so-and-so, spoke with one of his interpreters on the phone, who said he does not believe he will survive the next couple of days. The Taliban is going door to door. The Lord knows the situation intimately, what the outcome of it all will be, and is sovereign over it. And prayer is the greatest weapon we have. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in this time of need in Christ the Lamb. 
I'm going to invite the worship team back up to the stage. Um, and as they come up, let's, let's pray. Lord God, many of us in this room have no idea what religious persecution looks like. Many of us in this room have no idea what it means to fear for your life because of your faith. God, you had been on the move in Afghanistan in mighty ways. Thousands were coming to faith in you. And Lord, at this time, we pray for your protection over them. We pray for your hand to move mightily, to save those who declare that you are Lord, who stand boldly for what they believe, who stand boldly for you. And God, for those that don't survive, for them you have the crown of life, for being faithful unto death. God, there is struggle and tribulation for faith all around this world. God, help us to see this world with your eyes. Help us to have hearts that break for the things that break yours. Help us to realize that no matter what it is, you are there. You are sovereign. You are on your throne. And you are not worried. For you are a God who controls all these things, who holds them tightly in your hand. Even when we face struggle, when we face fear, when we face doubt, you hold us in your hand. You love us in ways we couldn't even imagine. So much so you sent your son to die for us, to pay a price, to suffer a death for us so that we could have eternal life. God, thank you. Thank you for the ways you have loved us, for the ways you love your church, and for the witness of those who are standing up for their faith under intense trial. May we learn from them and see your strength. In Christ's name, and for his sake, for his glory.